Oh, looks like there's several committee members in the uh, in the waiting room or the attendee list. Um, do I need to, I can push allow to talk, but I can't let them in. Should I just promote them all to panelists? Could you promote the committee members to panelists like uh, Devin, Galena, Kelsey, Martha, Noah, and Jaja, please. And Kenyatta. Uh, Alex, not everyone you're adding is a committee member. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Galena. Apologies for the technical issues we're having uh, for the whole committee. If y'all can bear with us, please. We'll get started shortly. No problem. Good morning. Um, so we, uh... I see Devin and Elliot. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah so it's it's uh, Devin, Noah, Elliot, Martha Lindner. Yeah, Devin. And um, Bradley's iPhone and uh, Angie are not committee members. Okay. I will remove. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good to see you. Alex. I'm getting ready to change into my computer if you will promote me. Um, I'm not going to get off of this link until I can access my computer. Understood, Shasha. Uh, Alex Kripner is uh, helping uh, me uh, manage the meeting, so we'll keep an eye out for you when you join. Okay, and then Noah is Apparently, both in the attendee list and on the panel. Noah, are you are you there? Yeah, I am here. I guess I, I, Fantastic. I, I, get, I get two checks that way, I guess, huh? Um, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here however you need me. I appreciate it. Uh, OK, um, Alex, uh, I believe we've got all the committee members that have joined the call uh, in the appropriate spot if you want to do roll call. Perfect. OK, give me one second. Okay, hello everybody. Let's do some roll call. So please um, say you are here when I call your name. Devin Connick Cease. 
Yes, here. And I apologize if I uh, say your name incorrectly. Please let me know. It's Konixis. Konixis, thank you. Uh, Noah Fay. Hi, yep, I'm here. Not sure why I'm not popping up on video, but I'm here. Okay, let's see. I promoted you to panelists a couple times now. It should work. Um, moving on. Eddie Matlock Mahone. Here. Thank you. Martha Linder. Here. Portia Anderson. Patricia Barnes. Elliot Hart. I'm here. Antoinette Lambert. Kelsey Beckmeyer. Hi, all here. Hey, Kelsey. Galena White. Present. Thank you. Zsa, Zsa Floyd. Here. Kenyatta Carol Hillman. Here. Sherry Tillman. Okay. Nine members present. You guys have four on. Dorothy, can I have you promote me on my computer to a panelist? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alex. Um, Jaja, are you able to uh, give the land acknowledgement for this meeting today? She is transitioning from one device to another. Does anyone else feel inclined to start us off with the land acknowledgement? Okay, so it's been a while since I've done done land acknowledgement and might have been at the old policy policy advisory committee. Um, I want to honor that we are on, on the lands of the Coast Salish people who are the original stewards of this land and caretakers of, of um, its wildlife. And, and um, we are uh, guests on this land um, and we are, we are forever indebted to them as the original caretakers. And whenever we have the opportunity, we um, should not just acknowledge, but also advocate for uh, the, the tribes of the Coast Salish uh, to be recognized by um, the government and uh, get their, um, their recognition um, memorialized um, officially. And that's my, been a while since I've done a land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Hi, Jaja, did you wanna uh, add anything to my land acknowledgement? No, I think you've done fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, first thing that I wanted to, to, to go over is uh, briefly some updates around the coordinated entry system so y'all are aware. Uh, we are going to go through a, a little bit of a staffing change in the short term. Uh, tomorrow's my last day on the team. 
uh, we have a fully staffed team otherwise, and the point person for a lot of the communications going forward will be our program coordinator, coordinator Leah Fahori, who has been on the team for a couple months and had previously been at the at the RHA in another role. Uh, she stepped in um, after Olivia Heidos left uh, a few months ago. Uh, additionally, my colleague on the call, Beth, Beth Lazar, is one of the deputy chief program officers for the RHA, and she'll be making making uh, managerial uh, decisions and taking on that role in the interim while the RHA uh, hires a replacement for the for the manager position. Additionally, the team that's that's in place now is uh, experienced and has all the tools they need in order to continue to do the work uh, at a, on a regular basis at the same level of quality. So I don't expect any um, hiccups between now and the, the, the new manager stepping in, but I wanted to, to make you all aware of that. And um, just as a reminder on the agenda that was sent out uh, Monday morning, that agenda uh, also um, contains the bylaws for this committee, which are derived from the bylaws for the uh, Continuum of Care Committee, which this committee is a subcommittee of that committee. I've said committee a lot of times, so, so uh, bear with me. Um, those are the updates that, that I have right now before I go into a presentation. Beth, is there anything that you want to share for the, for the group? Thank you, Alex. Um, I don't have too much to share beyond what Alex mentioned about the team. Um, I'm excited to work with you all over the next, uh, hopefully, few weeks, maybe a month or two as we hire in a new manager. Um, but please know that I am here to... Uh, support our coordinated entry team and you can reach out to me at any time and this committee. Thanks Beth. Um, Alex, I see Dr. Patricia uh, Barnes-Sam has joined and is in the attendee uh, group if you want to promote them, please. And Marvin is also over there. I know that he wanted to attend. While that's taking place, uh, does anybody have any questions before we move forward to the presentation? Okay. Hearing no questions. I will thank uh, Beth for putting your email in the chat. I will uh, present. Um, and can folks confirm that you received the documents on Monday morning, please? Okay, yes. A lot of thumbs up months. Great. Can everyone see this uh, slide deck? Yes. I see it. Okay, great. I can see some of you, but I cannot see all of you. So let's see if we can present. Is this presenting correctly? So I have a really wide screen monitor and sometimes things look really tiny. It, it's not. We have the presenter view right now. We can okay, see thanks, two Eddie. slides. Let's see. All right. I think I just might do it like this then. So we're going to do it old fashioned. Um, the the uh, presentation today is going to be briefly about the update on performance of the transition that we we uh, we made um, in the middle of this year, beginning April seventeenth. As a reminder, we expanded access to those who can potentially get uh, referred into housing. Previously, we had operated a, 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 a small segment of the population known as the priority pool that had a primary access to housing. Uh, between April and the end of May, we uh, managed a 60-day uh, period of transition where we uh, offered that access more broadly for anyone potentially in the community experiencing homelessness while still making sure that we supported those previously prioritized prioritized households to get into housing. 
Um, I have some uh, really uh, preliminary data related to performance um, and in terms of duration. And the duration that I will uh, show is duration between the uh, unit becoming available in HMIS. And this is a reminder for folks to give context. Uh, housing providers post their availability in the homeless management information system. The, uh, the coordinate entry team uh, sees that opening and we connect people to housing by making referrals to that, that housing. And that um, has uh, something that um, is recorded in HMIS, obviously. And the table that I'm, that I'm showing right now uh, looks at two separate timeframes one before the, the change in process, that's the April 17th, 2022 to April 16th, 2023. That's one day before the process changed. And the second, the second section is April 17th, 2023, beginning at the part of change to November 14th, 2023. So the first portion is looking at a year's worth of data. And the second one is looking at approximately six months. And that just has to do with how much time has passed since we changed the, the process. You can can see that on average the time from uh, refer from opening to referral has been reduced from previously 108 to 27 uh, uh, days. The time from opening to enrollment has changed from previously 117 days to 53 days. And the number of openings in this data set just for awareness is 1,013 for the for the first part and 422 for the second part. Uh, a board member uh, uh, White, I see your hand is raised. Hi, uh, sorry for not getting this uh, information ahead of time, but uh, was this change uh, opening up the uh, pool, uh, was that made um, because of information about um, how limiting um, resources offered to the people who are most in need um, actually reduces positive outcomes? It, it's, I have a follow-up question. Yeah, so so I think it's it's helpful to describe the way that the process was before. So from uh, the implementation of coordinated entry at a regional level, when the county implemented it in. Um, uh, in June of 2016, there was a segment that were prioritized for housing. There was also a policy in place that was described as external fills. And essentially the way the mechanics worked is an, a unit would become available uh, through the coordinated entry process. If there was a, a failure to connect a household to that available unit, a household derived from the small segment of prioritized people, then the unit would become, uh, it would return to the housing provider for them to fill as they see fit, keeping uh, with their commitments uh, made to funders. So that external fill process started off uh, initially kind of slow, but by, by the end of 2022, for single adults at least, I have data, two thirds of the resources were going to external fill. So they were being filled beyond the priority pool. And I think that this, this uh, says a little bit about um, prioritizing a, a subset of folks experiencing homelessness and trying to, in a, in a short amount of time, connect them to, to navigation that often includes the activity of outreach because they may or may not be actively engaged with providers in the community. And the other piece is really, really uh, taken from our learnings from the emergency housing voucher work. So as a reminder, in uh, mid-2021, HUD released uh, the American Recovery Plan, I believe, was the name of the, of the legislation that that uh, gave uh, a total of nationwide 70,000, what are essentially choice vouchers to communities across the country. Uh, we, I believe, received uh, in the order of just under 800 vouchers across King County, Seattle uh, Housing Authority and Renton Housing Authority. The stipulation from HUD was that those public housing agencies had to work with the COC, the Continuum of Care, and the coordinated entry system in order to connect folks to those resources. We had, over time, one of the highest performing uh, emergency housing voucher programs in the nation compared to comparably sized COCs. And that was in, in no small part due to the what, what, what we described as reverse matching, which is a provider is actively engaged serving an individual or family and has developed rapport, has gotten to know them, has done some preliminary work potentially on documentation. They are committing in both sense for EHVs and for this new process to help support the activities of navigation to get someone into housing. So the, the 
taxation of that priority pool sub subset was accounting for uh, a, a design that we had seen demonstrate work uh, more effectively. And secondarily, we received guidance from HUD uh, because we solicited guidance from HUD in the I believe it was the middle of 2022 related to the external fill process. HUD issued a letter that in the, that uh, directed the RHA to close the external fill process to keep it to be in keeping with the COC guidance. And so what we have done is we have taken the design from the emergency housing vouchers, expanded access to be able to leverage the capacity and the expertise that already exist in those relationships that were already built. And then we also closed the external fill. So we so we did two things simultaneously, one a design implementation and two to, to, to come into full compliance with HUD directives. Eddie, I see your hand is raised, but but Galina, I want to make sure that I answered your question to see if you do have a follow-up question. I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Um, board member Matlock Mahan, you have a question? Um, so I just do want to kind of call out kind of some of the stuff I see there in the data that while yes, the time to referral has drastically decreased. Um, but the time of enrollment has almost tripled between the referral and enrollment time. Do we know why? Because it went from before before it was nine days, now it's a 26 day difference. I mean, do we have any type of data of like to why that time between referral and enrollment has increased so much? I, I also noticed that I don't have any additional insights. I think this is something that you as a committee can uh, follow up on uh, with the RHA, particularly, and, and I think I've shared this in a previous meeting as well, and I put this in the deck. Uh, I think there is a good cause to ensure that that type of uh, question gets answered in an annual evaluation for the coordinate entry system, which is a requirement of, of, of the grant. So um, considering we're at the end of the year and this process shift happened in the middle of the year, I, I expect that the RHA and Beth, I see that you came off, off of, off of uh, or on camera, uh, that the RHA would uh, use uh, 2024 to do an evaluation of uh, the coordinate entry system in 2023. Beth, does that, is that in keeping with your expectations or anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, that's meeting with my expectations. Um, we really want to look back on 2023 and, and understand it more in depth. So, uh, you know, that will be on our radar for sure. Yeah, and 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 board member, committee member Matt Lachmehan, um, this is this is the data that I was able to gather, um, you know, with my limited skills. So, I, I think that is a very very good question to ask. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we move forward? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit about prioritization methodologies and why I strongly endorse administrative data uh, for, for whatever prioritization methodologies is used in the coordinated entry system. Um, those of you on the call, I know you all remember the process that started at the beginning when a coordinated entry was implemented at the county uh, using what was primarily the BI SPDAT with all of its issues. Uh, and and, I, and those, those problems have been discussed um, ad nauseum, but uh, essentially the, the 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 beauty of administrative data is that it uh, prevents uh, the litany of questions being uh, proposed and asked and required of people experiencing homelessness. People in a crisis should not have to uh, divulge uh, uh, a lot about their experiences, especially at the beginning of their engagement, uh, their request to get help. It's it's uh, likely re-traumatizing. And additionally, uh, there is no tool that is ever going to be perfect. And, and I think that's one thing that this community attempted to do back in 2018, which is to craft something that was superior to what the BISPAT was being able to do, uh, but that is that is no small task. And then I question the value of that, particularly when we have uh, as a community and uh, and as uh, systems, multiple systems, we collect a lot of data about, on people and being able to use the data that is already there as a way to determine 
the unfortunate circumstance related to cordate entry and the homeless response system in general is that scarcity is the primary driver, in my opinion, of every challenge that we experience uh, as a system trying to end homelessness. And scarcity is the primary driver, of course, for prioritization. In a perfect world, prioritization would be irrelevant because scarcity would not be a thing. You'd have adequate resources for the need. But until that day comes, you have to uh, engage in some sort of prioritization process using administrative data so that way you're not, you're not uh, potentially re-traumatizing folks and being thoughtful about what you ask, when you ask it, and is it really relevant for the next step? And that is one of, that those are the reasons why um, I strongly endorse the continuation, the continual use of administrative data. The other piece is as you iterate, and coordinated entry is you know by its very nature something that you're going to have to iterate on because no one has perfected it, and it has to be customized to the customized to the community it's in. You're going to have need to to change things, and if you change things using administrative administrative data, you're not necessarily provoking a re-engagement reassessment of everyone in the community. If you were to use a tool that is a questionnaire or an assessment, quote unquote, that would provoke a reassessment of thousands of people in the community and a re-traumatization thereof. So th that's another reason. The, the Finally, I think when it comes to equity, you know, we collect a lot of data related to the identities and experiences of our unhoused neighbors. And a lot of the time, the uh, argument is made with tools and assessments to use proxies, or even sometimes with administrative data, to use proxies to, to get at these identities and experiences where we have data that specifically ties to them. I would discourage you all from engaging in proxies. I think that those are equity add-ons and therefore not in, in they're not unless equity is integrated into the thing from the very from the very uh, uh, get-go, you're gonna uh, uh, fail to meet your goals. Uh, and we've seen that with other prioritization methodologies we've attempted in this community. Um, as a reminder, we have up until recently been using a COVID oh, uh, council or committee member, Fed. You have your hand raised? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Alex. I appreciate everything that you said. I just want to highlight there's no easy answer to this, and I, I'm not proposing an alternative inherently, but just the maybe the counter or the caution to admin data. There are a lot of people who do not interface with the systems that collect the data we would use who often have a high degree of overlap of the very populations we're looking to serve. And so just being mindful of how we balance those two things is fundamentally critical to the system. I, I concur 100% committee member Faye. Uh, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, to go over COVID partization, no data set is perfect, which is what I'm hearing from you. Um, we had in the methodology accounted for folks that had not engaged with any of the any of the systems to give them that risk factor because you know to to use the 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 concept of you would want to uh, err on the side of of caution and inclusivity rather than on the opposite and exclusivity. So so I agree completely. Um, the proposal that we'll get to in a few minutes uh, is founded exclusively on HMIS data, which is something that, uh, in in theory, encapsulates the homeless response system. We know that there's a lot of folks engaged outside of the homeless response system, but no work related to coordinated entry can begin unless it is starting in, in HMIS as 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 uh, mandated by HUD. Um, as a reminder for coded prioritization, which we stopped using uh, as a result of the uh, data sharing agreements. So so. In 2020, we uh, set up the county, set up data sharing agreements with uh, Washington Commerce to obtain Medicaid related data and healthcare for the homeless network to uh, obtain uh, healthcare data. We iterated on COVID partization in early 2023 and included behavioral health data from the county and gender identity from HMIS. Uh, because of the, the COVID uh, uh, um, um, declaration ending, we lost access to the integrated data that the county maintains. So we no longer able to use healthcare data or behavioral health uh, data, which is why we stopped using COVID prioritization. Uh, in the short term, what we wound up doing in order to be able to, to, to have some way to tie break or prioritize in, in this case is we created these uh, very rudimentary uh, three tier structure. The first being the length of time of the current episode, the second one being the experience of survivors, and the third one being the unsheltered versus sheltered. But the way that the data was captured and is captured today, it uses a, a granular calendar picker to be able to select the date that the date that the 
the, the episode of homelessness began. As you might imagine, the likelihood of, uh, of two folks having that same day is pretty slim. Additionally, they may not necessarily be the, the household with the longest length of time as recorded. So the determining factor as it stands today is the length of time of the current episode. And that, of course, uh, doesn't get us to any of the equity developments that we made th via COVID partisanship. It's also really blunt as a tool, and it doesn't necessarily uh, um, um, it doesn't necessarily honor the experiences and identities of of, uh, of our own house neighbors as broadly as other options. Um, so so just going back to what we're what we're proposing today is. Uh, using some of the stuff that we developed under uh, COVID prioritization V2 that would, will not be called COVID prioritization, uh, making sure that we are centering more the experiences of survivors that are actively fleeing, and then integrating length of time uh, homeless as it's captured in HMIS and episodes as they're captured in HMIS. And the data quality on that last piece can be a little challenging be because uh, people's experiences are so uh, varied and nuanced that it's, it's challenging to be able to ensure that that's perfectly entered, but the the um, the duration accounts for uh, all of the uh, the ranges that we tend to see, particularly with single adults when they're nominated for housing. And that and that can unfortunately go on for decades. And that the uh, methodology that we're proposing here accounts for that duration and prioritizes in that in that segment, those with the longest length of time experiencing homelessness. But really want to highlight here that this, this proposed methodology is structured out into, into three segments. And in descending order, the primary segment is uh, looking at the identities as captured in HMIS related to age. So those are elders uh, 64 to 75 and 75 and above. Uh, race and ethnicity, that is American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, African American, uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latino. Uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander and uh, additionally Middle Eastern and North African was introduced in uh, HMIS data standards and so that's included as well. Gender identity, uh, th those who are trans, non-binary, culturally specific identity or different identity, those last two are terms in HMIS, so I'm using them very specifically. And then uh, as a secondary uh, prioritization under gender identity, it is cis uh, female identified uh, profiles. And then finally, pregnancy status. And that one really impacts uh, families, obviously, as families are defined in the system as households with minors or with a pregnancy in the household. Uh, the second segment are, as I mentioned, survivors that are currently fleeing in the coordinated entry system enrollment. There is a, a data point related to are you actively fleeing? And that, that would be captured there and prioritized. And then uh, finally, the segment for tertiary uh, 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 risk factors are as I mentioned, length of time of the current episode, and in the last three years, how many episodes are captured in HMIS, and that can go up to the number four. Any questions about that before I move forward? Uh, committee member Matt Um, What is there a proposed way on those tertiary ones to capture that? Is it going to be a, a form again where it's going to be up to a provider to enter that, or is it going to be pulled from HMIS records? It, it is, and, and just for situational awareness, um, um, committee member Matlock Mahan, when they're referring to a form, uh, we currently collect some of the, 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 the present data we use in a smart sheets form without personally identifying information. Uh, uh, committee member Matlock Mahan, to answer your question, that data would be captured in the coordinated entry system program enrollment, which uses the minimum uh, data points that HUD mandates for such an enrollment. And they include uh, when you select uh, place on for human habitation, et cetera, or you, you select emergency shelter, it gives you the option to state with a calendar when the episode began, and then it asks you the number of episodes in the last three years. There are circumstances such as folks that are actively fleeing or, or people that are exiting institutions where that, that, that those two questions, the date and the episodes are not asked. Those situations are still accounted for in the methodology. And if you look at the appendix for the slide deck, you'll see them under the table as uh, recorded as 16. That's the lowest line because that data is, is, not, is, not, is not there in HMIS. But for most other circumstances, it would be captured and, and uh, it would be entered uh, presumably by a provider in the community. Did that answer your question? Right. Any other questions before we move forward? Okay. 
So uh, I, I, I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was just looking back at our um, agenda for the day. And it looks like the board chair and bylaws were already discussed, if I'm seeing this, but it was it, the intent was listed as informational. Um, but the problem with that is that you're you're presenting at new bylaws, and I think that we should vote on those before we am I am I misunderstanding something here? Because there was something I actually wanted to add, and um, I just want to make sure that we don't just gloss over that. That's an excellent point, uh, committee member White. I can pause this presentation and you all can choose to review and vote on the bylaws. Would that be helpful? That would be great. Sorry about that. And um, uh, I might as well grab the opportunity to talk about what I wanted to talk about. It's actually relevant to what we're discussing at the moment. Um, what we're talking about here is the prioritization of different people based on tiny, tiny inflections of how much we can influence whether or not they're going to get housing. And um, we're talking about just like influencing whether like 100 people get housing, basically. Um, and we're trying to make sure that everybody has the very best chance to access these extremely limited resources that we have. And they're not the resources that we have, resources that we have aren't aren't actually going to do the job. And so we're just like what we should be doing is not having prioritizations on who gets what. We should just be giving everybody a home according to what they need, period. Um, so um, I think it's important for us to all recognize on this coordinated entry committee, honestly, that what we're doing here is um, just a drop in the bucket as far as actually solving the homelessness problem. And um, I would like to see for us to recognize that at every public and um, uh, public of record meeting that um, what we're doing here is uh, I'd like a, a solid legal statement of us saying as a group, we recognize that what we are doing here is um, fiddling while Rome burns. I can't think of a better analogy at the moment. Um, just like uh, we're we're trying really hard to see that a few people get housed when uh, hundreds and thousands of people are not going housed. And this, this, this committee is not solving the problem. I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm sorry. I just think we need to acknowledge that. Yeah, committee member White, you shouldn't be sorry. Um, I uh, appreciate you bringing us back to that fact. Um, it is not lost on me, and I believe you know, knowing uh, many of the folks on this on this uh, committee currently for years, it is not lost on them either. Um, I think that um, this is what I was attempting to highlight related to scarcity being the primary driver for a lot of the decisions and activities in the homeless response system generally, not just coordinated entry. Uh, you are you are right, and I and I will I will uh, endorse uh, here as as a person and on behalf of my team members on the coordinated entry team. Housing is a human right. And no one should ever experience uh, homelessness. And uh, we we would love to be able to see that day. And I would leave it to uh, my colleagues on the committee about whether or not they wish to amend the bylaws to include the proposed statements. I am not an expert in Robert's Rules of Order. I would look to my colleague Alex Piffner to be able to help with that if that's the case of the, the direction this committee wants to go. Uh, so long as we're able to finish the presentation that we had related to the proposed prioritization methodology and be able to take a vote, I'm I. I am willing to follow the direction of this committee anywhere that y'all take it. Uh, committee member uh, um, Carol uh, Hillman, I see your hand is raised. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I do realize that a lot of people are homeless and we'd like to house them all, but I do think we're taking the next step necessary and that's to try to categorize and prioritize the people. Thank you, Commander. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, 
hearing hearing the desire to review the bylaws um, and approve them, uh, I, I think that that's that's probably a prudent idea considering the bylaws uh, are something that that include the way that this committee uh, votes and approves uh, uh, items. So uh, does does er anyone uh, want to uh, propose that uh, the bylaws be uh, voted on? I I was proposing an amendment to the bylaws. I'd like to propose an amendment to the bylaws. Would you like to share that proposed amendment with the committee? Um, I can have a paragraph or a, a sentence written out and sent out to everybody before the next meeting. Thank you, committee member White. I am inclined to move forward with the remaining presentation and to continue with the proposed vote. Uh, I, yeah, I think that that would probably be appropriate. I think we should pause on any vote on the bylaws until we have the amendment and we can see it. Great, so thanks, that, Eddie. Yeah. A second, yeah. And thank you, uh, committee, for for uh, allowing us the space and time to have that conversation. And thank you, committee member White, for bringing it to to the forefront. Um, returning to the the presentation, uh, we did some modeling, uh, looking back at the last forty five days uh, for openings that were available through coordinated entry and the nominations to housing that were made to those openings. Uh, there, there in in all of these slides, you're going to see the blue part of the graph uh, indicating what who what happened, who was prioritized based off of the thing I just described, where it's primarily length of time of the current episode, and under orange, you're going to see what the proposed methodology would have done with that same group of nominations. Uh, and and I will at the beginning have I have these grouped out by population type, so single adults and families and young adults. The uh, table at this at the beginning that says, for instance, family nominations last 45 days. The unique profiles are 123, and the openings during that time frame were 19. The unique profiles do not uh, do not indicate the number of nominations in total, particularly with single adults. Uh, on average, we receive over 100 nominations at times for different openings. So, so the the nominations are are expensive, but really wanting to get to unique profiles. So that way, we we were able to demonstrate what would have happened were we already using this proposed uh, prioritization methodology. Does anybody have any questions about that before I move forward? Okay. So, yeah, Alex, uh, I have my hand up. I I'm sorry. I, Go ahead. Can I get some clarity on? current and proposed so under the current uh way that the ce is structured that's what i'm looking at and and what you're showing me is the proposed prioritization that's what orange is Cor correct and um committee member floyd and also for everyone's awareness uh were we to use this prioritization methodology, we wouldn't change the progress we've made on expanding access. The access would still remain as broad as it is. This is really about sequencing of the nominations we get, who should be given that opportunity first versus who who will, will go second. And that's, that's the unfortunate reality of coordinated entry. Did that answer your question, committee member Floyd? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, committee member Matlock Mahon. Hey, and sorry if I missed this, just want clarification on the chart itself where it says average age. Is that the length of time that it's taken for somebody to receive a referral or an enrollment, or is that the age of the of household? Thank you, uh, committee member Matlock Mahan. That is the age, the average age of the head of household. And re really, I, I think it's committee member Matlock Mahan. Well, just a uh, uh, Okay, I'm just wondering, I mean, yes, of course, that's important information, but I'm, I think that's interesting that that would drop so much the age of the person. 
I can I can describe. I think what would be helpful is if I went through the slides, and I think you'll you'll likely figure out the thing that I that I, I believe is impacting this. I also want to highlight that the, the 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 data set is really low for young people because of the number of openings that were available in that time frame. So uh, just take that into account. And some identities have a relatively low number associated with it with them. So that's something to 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 be to be mindful as well. So this is this is to to, to illustrate a potential uh, uh, opportunity and you know. What I, what I wanted to highlight by the end of the deck is to say, like everything core data entry, this is something that can be iterated on. And as things need to be adjusted, the team can help to, to support those adjustments. And this committee can help to direct them as well. So uh, looking at uh, uh, the ages of the families that, are, that were uh, previously prioritized, again, excuse me, the race and ethnicity of the families that were previously prioritized in blue, uh, you can see uh, the model indicates uh, a significant increase in uh, BIPOC households prioritized to housing under this methodology, and that, sh that should be unsurprising considering the integration of race and ethnicity uh, uh, into the methodology. Um, the other piece uh, relates to uh, gender identity. As I mentioned, uh, gender identity factors in with non-binary uh, um, uh, folks that are trans, um, uh, culturally specific identity and different identity being prioritized, as well as cis females. And then uh, this, I believe, is uh, factoring in with age somewhat, uh, committee member Matlock Mahon. Because pregnancy is integ integrated in there, we see a significant increase of what would have happened when it comes to pregnancy, just like we saw a significant increase in BIPOC households that would have been prioritized under the proposed methodology. Um, and here you can see, going from left to right, uh, the status, the fleeing status of the households. The, the number of households actively fleeing would have increased significantly from 32% to 68%. The average days of homeless in the episode increases slightly. The scale of these, uh, these uh, columns are a little misleading. So uh, 617 to 630, I think that that's pretty close. And then the um, episodes, it's, a, it's, it's an approximation for average, but 2.1 to 1.5. I think that the number of, of entries is something that to, to consider. So I would I would take the averages with a grain of salt. The next one is, of course, single adults. Uh, looking at the last 45 days, there were 332 unique profiles, but many more nominations than that for 24 openings. You can see that the age, again, the scale is a little misleading. The age stays pretty close to, to the same 50 to 57. Uh, you do see a significant difference when it comes to race and ethnicity for single adults. Uh, here, uh, 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 white identified uh, households were previously uh, um, gaining 57% of the uh, prioritized slots. Uh, under the new methodology, uh, the remained the redistribution is across uh, different identities. Uh, you can see the significant impact for Black and African American households, and then um, folks uh, related to to the gender data. You can see an increase in uh, cis females and an increase in uh, trans non-binary culturally specific identity and different identity. And then going from left to right, you can see fleeing. Uh, previously, there were uh, zero of those households that said that they were actively fleeing. Uh, the methodology would increase that to 22% potentially. The uh, average length of, of the current episode decreased significantly from 4,900 to 1,800. And the reason I suspect this is, uh, this is the case is because the previous methodology only used length of time. That was the deciding factor. And so this is much more uh, sophisticated. And so that number would decrease uh, organically or expectantly. And then the number of episodes, I think, is, you know, again, the averages and the data set are uh, uh, take with a grain of salt, but from 2 to 2.4. And then finally, young adults, again, bear in mind, the data set is really small. And I, I would be inclined to not include it at all, but I, but I wanted to be transparent with everyone to, to demonstrate that the number of openings is really low for young people and the number of young people, young profiles involved is really low as well. You can see the average age stays the same. 
uh, you do see an uh, increase in um, uh, the race, race and ethnic uh, distribution, uh, somewhat similar to you see with the other populations with an increase in BIPOC households being potentially prioritized for housing. Uh, you can also see an increase in the, um, the uh, cis female identity. The decrease here, 22% to 11%, I believe is related to the, the, the small number of data available. So again, I would take that with a grain of salt. And then again, moving from left to right, you can see fleeing going potentially from 33 to 56%. The average days homeless, again, expectantly decreasing. The scale of it is a little misleading, 1,800 to 1,600. And then the episodes being comparable from 3.1 to 2.8. Again, the data set is really limited. Um, but what I wanted to, to highlight with this and, and amend something on the slide deck is that uh, should you as a committee approve uh, this methodology, it would go to the Co Continuum of Care Committee on uh, December 6th and be presented uh, to them for, for final approval. I know that um, committee members uh, 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 Floyd and Beckmeyer have uh, volunteered to potentially present to that committee uh, if you do approve the methodology and the team would be ready to implement it. Uh, the next the next week, uh, assuming it was approved on the 6th of December. And then the, the ongoing monitoring of progress, like everything else, you'd want to ma maintain eyes on it. And if something is not working the way that you expected or intended it to work, that you would need to pivot. And that pivot is something that we've done in the past for previous prioritization methodologies. I think many of you recall that that history. And again, reminding you all and, and, it's, and, and, and the commitment from the RHA is to do a full evaluation of the core data entry system once in 2024 for the calendar year 2023. And then uh, future exploration of predictive modeling and integrated data is something that I would remind you all as a potential that requires a lot more time and investment to be able to, to develop something that we did not have in the short term. We wanted to be able to provide you with an option that is uh, better than just using length of time and is accessible now with the data we have access to now. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, hearing no questions, um, uh, committee member Faye. Yeah, <clears throat> Thank, thanks for this. Um, Alex, this is, this is interesting um, and the data is great. I'm, I'm curious, um, the, the age old question that we talk about a lot is where does service matching fit into the prioritization process and has that, would that change under this? schema or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and committee member Faye, who uh, I have had the honor of knowing since I believe 2007 or 2008, uh, is referring to a ongoing discussion that we have as colleagues related to the relevancy of service match in context of prioritization. Service match is relevant essentially to do good referrals and make sure people are getting what they need, not more and not less. Um, and to make sure that the housing provider is using their capacity and their expertise appropriately to house those that need it in order to stabilize. Um, I am uh, of the strong opinion that those two things should be decoupled, the, them being prioritization and service match. And uh, here, I, there is a history and an inclination to, to put those together. And I think having had deep conversations with, with uh, uh, community members over the years, uh, it is nearly impossible to do that effectively across multiple types of housing. If you're referring to one particular type of housing, it becomes a, a lot more simple. But when you've got a, a tapestry a, a, of a portfolio, that becomes a lot more challenging. So decoupling them gives you the opportunity to prioritize folks based off of equity principles and other experiences that you're you're trying to focus in on and then having the service match follow that appropriately because there isn't a specific identity that is going to be exclusively an appropriate service match to any housing and each each identity each experience is going to be varied and they're going to be folks within those particular subsets of data that are going to need different types of resolutions to their housing crisis and that's where the service match comes in and certainly and and I will I will say for the record, and this is something that the team is situationally aware of, we have the opportunity to 
to do better at service matching. That is very keenly on our minds. And uh, we are still developing a, a coordinated entry onboarding that will hopefully begin to address some of those challenges. But really, when we talked about the improvements to the process, we wanted to decrease, we wanted to increase the velocity to making referrals, first and foremost, and broadening access, and then improving the quality of those matches and the service appropriate, the appropriate service matches, something that uh, we are we're, we're very much interested in improving, and particularly, I know uh, committee member Faye, your constituency, constituency when it relates to high behavioral needs of single adults is one that is always in our mind, but it is also part of the larger uh, uh, you know requirement of being able to do something well. Did that answer your, your question, committee member Faye, or anything you want to add? Um, no, I appreciate that. I I, I think it it does. Uh, I mean it. it Imposing a super complex challenge here of how we read those things, so I just you know wanted to keep that on on top of on top of mind while we think about the prioritization schema. And I I think I I I sh I've moved over time, and I think I share your sense that prioritization and service matching can be more decoupled than the way we've historically thought about it. And I think that's probably a good move for us moving forward. That feels like an an honor, uh, committee member Faye. Thank you very much for saying that to me. Committee member Matlock Mayhan, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, thank you. And thank you, Noah, for bringing that up because I, I was actually thinking about that too. Um, I mean, is there conversation though? I mean, is the housing needs form, which is currently used, I think, in the single adult population, but is that going to be continued? Because I know that that does get a little bit to the service matching side of it where it's kind of is selected. Um, or is that is there plans for that to be integrated more or retired at a part of this process? I think, committee member uh, Malik Mahan, there is always an opportunity to improve. But I, you know, you recall having been a member of of like case conferencing over the years that uh, the preferences is something it's critical. Like I have, I have a strong, I have many strong opinions. I'm just sharing with you all because this is the last, this is the last meeting, and I share them. Actually, I share them all the time. I think that there's three essential components to a good referral. One is eligibility clearly, and that's funder-driven eligibility. And two is the uh, preferences and the needs as stated by the household or the individual, the individual or the family. That is critical. And then finally, the service match. And the service match is the most complex because it's relatively easy if you are being able to have a conversation with an individual or family to understand what it is that they're, what they, what they are looking for. Preferences can be related to geography. Preferences can be related to programmatic uh, characteristics, but preferences are essential to make effective nominations and referrals, because if not, what you have is what I know we all know is someone gets to the place, someone learns a little bit more about it. No, thank you. I don't want that. And then that's wasted energy. It's more friction in the system. It's delay for throughput. It's all the things that we're trying to avoid. So it's eligibility, it's preferences, and it's service matched. So housing needs form, I think, is something that has been, as you know, uh, it's been developed over time from many different iterations of something comparable. And, you know, I think it it it's streamlined to my earlier uh, point of we should only ask the minimum questions at the right time to people and not get ahead of ourselves and be administrators for administrators sake and just ask a bunch of questions because we want to know the answer. If we're not, if we don't need to know and we're not going to know that knowledge isn't going to do something to deliver value in as short of a time as possible for the people that we're trying to serve. So so I think housing needs form is going to be a part of the profits, pro process. Preferences certainly can be iterated upon. But really, when I'm talking about being able to orient people to coordinate entry is, uh, uh, in, in this context at least, is to demystify some of the nuances that can only be learned over time through experience. And I know lots of the folks on this committee know the tapestry of the housing resources in the community because of the work that they, that they have done. And that is not necessarily very clear or intuitive to people that are coming into the work for the first time or are new to the work. And being able to talk about uh, the characteristics of the housing resources in really uh, concrete terms and not in narratives, I think is really critical. And particularly I, I, what I'm trying to highlight is the need to be able to effectively outline the depth of services for a housing resource, the duration of the subsidy, if appropriate, the length of time of the, pro, the, the program itself is essential, where people are, how, how they meet those folks, how frequently do they engage with them. Those types of things are, are concrete and can be outlined. And my hope is to be able to, to, be, uh, to, to articulate those things for every housing resource in our community. So if you're new to the work, all you have to understand 
understand the foundations of what you need to know to make an effective match, and then you apply that knowledge to the available inventory. Did that answer your question, Committee Member Malakai? Very clear. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Any other questions? Okay. Um, again, I'm not the expert on Robert's Rules of Order, um, but I believe this would be the point where someone would propose a vote. I make a motion that we um, accept the the new format of the prior to uh, prioritization and pro as proposed through the slide. Sorry, Alex, really quick point of order. Did you want to review the schema first? Yeah, can... Uh, I can I can absolutely re review the schema. Okay. So I think that that would be helpful to give more context so we can all know how the prioritization is actually going to work. I appreciate that, Committee Member um, Matlock Mahon and Committee Member, Member Floyd. I'll just I'll I'll do this and and then uh, turn it back over to you. Um for those of you that recall, this is very similar. This first, uh, so to remind you all, there are there are three segments of this methodology. The first one is based off of the um, the, the, the 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 identities and uh, and pregnancy status of households as captured in HMIS, and it's inspired by. It is not the same, but it is inspired by the COVID prioritization version two. So we uh, removed the uh, healthcare risk factors and the behavioral health uh, risk factors because we no longer have access to that data, and we uh, sequenced them in the same uh, uh, manner as before. And you can see on the slide deck. Uh, each uh, tier indicates uh, combinations of identities. And on the right, you can see the uh, tier number on the previous version, uh, on the most recent version of the prioritization. And on the, on the left, it's the current tier. So they're in descending order, um, indicating first uh, highest people over the age of 75 that have the race and ethnicity risk and have the gender identity risk related to trans non-binary, culturally specific identity and different identities. And then uh, you're looking at over 75 race and ethnicity risk and then uh, cis female gender identity. Uh, and then these two, these two under three, sorry, these two um, combinations under the third tier are uh, are comparable in that there's no hierarchy between them. So those are folks that over 75 and have the race and ethnicity risk or over 75 and have the gender identity, trans, non-binary, culturally specific identity or different identity. Moving on to four, it's over 75 and cis female identity. Uh, and then five, race and ethnicity, uh, gender identity, trans or non-binary, CSI or DI and pregnant. Uh, six is 65 to 74, race and ethnicity uh, uh, risk factor, gender identity, trans non-binary, CSI, or DI. Uh, seven has three, three different combinations, 65 to 74, race and ethnicity, uh, gender identity, cis female, or race and ethnicity, gender identity, cis female, currently pregnant, or gender identity, trans non-binary, CSI, or DI, currently pregnant. Eight is 65 to 74, race and ethnicity, or 65 to 74, gender identity, trans non-binary, culturally specific identity, or different identity. Eight is 65 to 74, gender identity, cis female, or gender identity, cis female, and currently pregnant. 10 is race, ethnicity, gender identity, trans, non-binary, culturally specific identity, or different identity. 11 is race and ethnicity, uh, risk factor, gender identity, cis female. And finally, at tier 12, we get to the, the single risk factors after we've exhausted all of the combinations, starting with those over 75, then 65 to 74, then those with the race and ethnicity risk factor, then trans, non-binary, culturally specific identity or different identity, and then uh, uh, cis female gender identity. And 16, it, that is there for if none of these things are applicable. So 
So that's the first segment of the of the tier of the prioritization methodology. Any questions about that before I move forward? Uh, committee member Beckmeyer. Committee member Beckmeyer, I can't hear you. Yep. I need to bring this down, pardon me. Um, not on the prioritization, there is a question in the Q&A section that I wanted to elevate. Um, there's a question regarding if there are multiple people within the same tier around tie breaking. Um, so I just wanted to elevate that that was a question and um, we'll lead it to you to respond. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for raising that. Um, the the uh, the the attendee uh, James uh, that will become clear and and I'll, and I'll and I'll and I'll I'll follow back up but that'll be uh, become clear once we look at the the second and third segments the secondary and tertiary segments of the methodology. Uh, committee member Matt Lachmayhan, your hand is up. Um. So. Thank you. Um, so I think, um, and I know this was something that was raised to you and the team over there when when uh, Copri came out. Um, is um, will there be a way for uh, in or some type of a way to kind of um, to get feedback about that. Committee member Matt Luck Mahon, I'm not sure if it's just me, but you were cutting out. Okay, so yeah. Are you able to please repeat that? I, I couldn't hear the question itself. Um, if you can hear me, go to Devin and come back to me. I'm gonna switch my internet. We'll do uh, committee member uh, Connexies. Thanks. Um... I am just wondering, and maybe I missed this, but um, where clients, um, where folks refuse to answer a question or where, you know, there's data not collected, can you say a little bit more about how that would be factored into this schema? Um, just be, I'm thinking, especially like for certain marginalized identities where I know folks are less likely to disclose information about their identity and wouldn't want that to like negatively impact. Uh C correct. And that's something that we integrated with uh, the previous methodology, COVID prioritization, related to the data in other data sets. Uh, related to HMIS, that methodology didn't account for folks that refused to answer uh, the, the responses to what are mostly universal data elements in, in the profile. And to be clear, folks can folks who are refusing to have their data shared in HMIS that are going to be de-identified, they can be de-identified and still the responses to these questions can be recorded. So uh, while there is the possibility that someone could outright refuse to answer the questions, someone who is, as an example, fleeing or has a certain medical diagnosis that prefers not to have their data captured in HMIS can still have these risk factors collected. Did that answer your question, committee member? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, committee member Beckmeyer. There was also another question um, in the Q&A around why pregnancy wasn't in the 1516 tier. Um, I provided a response that I thought I would just name here. Um, Pregnancy as a factor would not be a, a factor alone. It has to be tied to another identity, and that's accounted for um, under Tier 7 and under Tier 9 um, for gender identity, trans non-binary, um, or other identity or, identity or cultural specific identity, as well as gender identity cis female. Um, so pregnancy alone um, is not a, a, a factor that isn't also tied to another identity. So I just wanted to elevate that. Thank you for that. Um, committee member Matt Lachmahan, you changed the internet? Uh, yeah, can you hear me better now? Beautiful. Um, so I just wanted to raise, I mean, I know we'd uh, talked about this when Copri first came out, things like that. Um, will there be a way for providers to be able to identify what tier somebody is in? Uh, I, 
The simple answer is no, and that that relates to the 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 scope of it. If you're thinking about the potential uh, for folks that could be nominated, you're talking about thousands of people. We certainly want wouldn't want to share out a list of thousands of people with their with their potential um, you know, prioritization. Um, but we 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 by by sharing the schema, we hope that it's decipherable enough so someone and and you know when testing the data this is something i did frequently is to to just look at it and go through the process knowing what you know about the profile or the individual if, if you're doing direct service and and be able to validate there um any other questions before i move forward to the second uh, segment yes um alex uh Committee member, member Matt Lock Mahone, you said co pride. Tell me what that is, please. Yes, uh, committee member Floyd, uh, co pride is short for COVID prioritization, which is the prioritization that we were using from 2020 to 23. Yeah. Uh, uh, committee member Matt Lock Mahone is just using the, the shorthand of it. Okay. Uh, so the second segment is a lot easier to explain. It is uh, folks that are reporting that they are actively fleeing in the court entry system enrollment. So if they're fleeing, they get priority in the secondary segment. And if they are not fleeing, they do not get priority in the secondary segment. And these things work in combination. And then finally, this table, uh, which is the homelessness history, this is the tertiary segment. Uh, it is uh, spread out, and I won't I won't read every number there because that would be exhausting. Uh, but it is going in descending order from the length of, the longest length of time to the shortest length of time. Uh, that longest length of time, I we built it out so that way it caps at a hundred years of the current episode, which is an absurd amount, but just to make sure that's inclusive of everyone. Uh, the uh, number of episodes are limited in the data capture for HMIS to the last three years. So the question is, uh, in the last three years, it's right here, number of times in the streets, emergency shelter, or safe haven in the past three years. And that that is uh, because of the way that HUD defines uh, those episode captures as it relates to, to chronic homelessness. Uh, again, uh, if someone is is uh, reporting that they are not in a place of for human habitation or shelter, the question isn't asked to them related to when did this episode begin or the number of episodes in the last three years, even though it may be relevant. It's just not asked in uh, the data in HMIS, but it's still accounted for under the 16th tier. So you can see that that data is... Uh, um, Splayed out, indicating the number of days when when the tier starts and the number of years as well, and then a language that uses simplified terms like thirty one or less than a year. Any questions about that? So I'm going to go back to the Q and A. Um, the attendee James um, asked about tiebreaking. And I think, uh, James, the likelihood of tie-breaking using this proposed methodology is extremely slim. And I say that because if you take into account that these three segments work in combination, this first one goes to 16. The second one is two. You either are reporting that you're fleeing or you're not fleeing. And the third one, the tertiary one, goes to 16. If you multiply 16 times two times 16, you get 512. So there's 512 potential uh, uh, tiers within this methodology. The likelihood of tie-breaking is very, very low. Uh, if there is a cause for tie-breaking, I would expect that my colleagues on the core data entry team uh, would be uh, likely following up with both of the households to make sure that the data quality is there and make sure the service match is there. Oftentimes that winds up shedding light on who is going to get the housing or not get the housing, or who is going to get the housing referral or not get the housing referral. Uh, any other questions? Okay. I move okay. for us to vote on the presented prioritization. And I second that. Uh, 
Uh, Alex uh, Piffner, are you able to, to, to take the vote? Yes, hello everybody. Okay, I'm gonna call your name and please let me know if your vote is um, approved or if you abstain. Devin Connick Cease. Uh, approved. Thank you. Noah Fay. Approved. Eddie Matlock Mahone. Approve. Martha Linder. Approve. Portia Anderson. Patricia Barnes. Approve. Patricia Sam. Approve. Oh, Sam, sorry. I messed that up. Elliot Hart. Approve. Antoinette Lambert. Kelsey Beckmeyer. Approve. Galena White. Approve. Jaja Floyd. Approve. Kenyatta Carol Hellman. Approve. Sherry Tillman. Okay, with 10 votes, the motion is passed. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, committee members, uh, for um, your work and your uh, your commitment to help improve the coordinate entry system. Uh, it's been an honor working with, with some of you for a short amount of time and an honor working with some of you for a long amount of time. I am uh, grateful that you all are here and I encourage you all to um, uh, reach out to the coordinate entry team and to the RHA team if you have any questions going forward. Uh, I will um, uh, look towards the C continuum of care board on December 6th to uh, take a vote on your, uh, your endorsement of this proposed methodology and hopefully approve it. And uh, if you need anything going forward, uh, my colleague uh, Beth Lazar uh, put uh, her contact information in the chat as well. And uh, for regular operations, uh, my colleague Leah Fahuri would be your point person. And Beth will be able to connect you with her if you do not have her contact information. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, but it's hey, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to Alex for the years in coordinated entry and everything that you've done. Uh, the people need some big shoes to, to fill with his absence. So, and thank you for getting this done for sure. It's been a pleasure working with you over the years. Likewise, committee member Matt Lafferty. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, Alex. It's a huge yeah. task. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to you, oh, too, Alex. Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, you have been a tremendous. Uh, wealth of information I've learned from you in different spheres that we've worked in together and I just really appreciate you and I appreciate your passion for this work. Thank you. You'll be sorely missed. Thank hey, you, thank you for everything, Alex. It's been really a pleasure working with you in a lot of different spaces. I think this is the end of it. I'll see y'all later. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. everyone. Thanks.